Welcome to Yamaha's two-stroke engine theory and diagnostics video. The object of this video is to give you an in-depth look at how current Yamaha two-stroke engine designs work, as well as provide some diagnostic, tuning, and maintenance techniques. We'll begin by looking at the differences between a two-stroke engine and a four-stroke engine. There are four essential functions that any internal combustion engine must accomplish. Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. A two-stroke engine completes these four necessary functions in just one 360-degree rotation of the crankshaft, while a four-stroke engine requires two complete crankshaft rotations to achieve the same results. The two-stroke produces power every rotation, the four-stroke every other crankshaft rotation. A two-stroke engine doesn't need as many moving parts either. The crankshaft, rod, and piston are all a basic two-stroke needs to accomplish a combustion cycle. Carefully placed ports or windows in the cylinder wall itself are open and closed by the piston's position in the cylinder. As the piston moves from the top to the bottom of the cylinder and back, exhaust gases are released and a fresh fuel mixture is taken in from the crankcase through the ports. A four-stroke requires many more moving parts to perform the same task because it uses a valve train. The valve train typically consists of an intake valve, exhaust valve, and camshaft. Depending on engine design, the valve train may also require rocker arms, push rods, and lifters. This makes for a much more complicated and expensive method of achieving internal combustion. Because the two-stroke's design uses the crankcase as part of the intake process, there's another obvious difference between it and a four-stroke. Lubricating oil is mixed with a fuel mixture rather than circulated in a pressurized lubrication system with a sump. Each type has its advantages, of course, so the application becomes an important factor in choosing which type of engine a given product should have. Weight and power characteristics, for example, are often considerations. A two-stroke's greater power output for its size and weight make it commonly chosen for motocross bikes, outboard motors, and personal watercraft. A four-stroke is more commonly chosen for products where different power characteristics are needed, and weight isn't as much of a concern, such as large motorcycles and ATVs. Now that we've covered the basic differences between two-stroke and four-stroke engines, let's take a look at how a two-stroke accomplishes internal combustion. Although the design is simple, the two-stroke's combustion process is fairly complicated. The intake process begins when the piston starts its upward motion. As the piston rises, a vacuum is created within the crankcase. This vacuum effect causes air to be drawn into the crankcase through the carburetor. As the vacuum draws air through the carburetor, it also picks up fuel from the float bowl to create the necessary air-fuel mixture. Once the piston has reached top dead center and starts to move downward, the mixture in the crankcase is compressed. The mixture can escape back through the intake port because it's blocked from doing so by the piston itself, or by a reed valve, or in some designs by a rotary valve. As the top of the piston continues its downward movement, the cylinder's transfer ports are uncovered. The compressed fuel mixture in the crankcase is forced through these ports into the combustion chamber. Now the piston moves up again, closing the transfer ports. The piston's continued movement upward compresses the fuel mixture in the combustion chamber while also creating crankcase vacuum to draw in fresh mixture for the next cycle. Just before the piston reaches top dead center, the spark plug ignites the compressed mixture. The heat and pressure of the burning mixture force the piston downward on the power stroke. The piston's power stroke also compresses the fresh fuel mixture in the crankcase in preparation for the next transfer process. But before the next fresh mixture enters the combustion chamber, the top of the downward moving piston uncovers the exhaust port. This releases the burnt gases from the ongoing power stroke into the exhaust pipe. The piston continues moving down. The transfer ports are uncovered again. 
allowing the compressed fuel mixture in the crankcase to enter the combustion chamber. The fresh mixture coming in assists in pushing the burnt mixture out of the exhaust port, a process called scavenging, which we'll explore in more detail later. A small amount of the fresh fuel mixture actually follows the exhaust gases out the exhaust port. This escaping mixture is pushed back into the combustion chamber by a negative sound wave created within the exhaust pipe. Obviously, exhaust system design plays an important role, so this sound wave is timed properly to capture the unburnt mixture in the combustion chamber before the rising piston closes the exhaust port. Again, this will be discussed in more detail later. Now let's take a look at two intake designs used by Yamaha. The first, and least complicated, is the piston port design. In a piston port induction system, the piston skirt is used to control the opening and closing of the intake port. This design is typically used in applications where a broad power band is not critical, such as small snowmobiles and race cars. The piston port design doesn't offer a broad power band because it's restricted to symmetrical port timing. This means that the intake port's open timing is the same as its closed timing relative to degrees of crankshaft rotation. The most common induction design used by Yamaha is the reed valve type. The advantage of the reed valve engine is its asymmetrical intake port timing that varies with engine RPM. As we see on this chart, the RVO or reed valve open timing changes with engine RPM. This valve open timing difference changes the characteristics of the engine slightly through the operating range. There are two types of reed induction. One type mounts the reed cage and carburetor on the cylinder and the other mounts them directly onto the crankcase. There are many in-depth design factors that are taken into consideration when determining which method is best suited for a given application. Earlier we mentioned the process of scavenging the effect incoming fresh fuel mixture has in helping to push exhaust gases out the exhaust port. Now let's take a closer look at how it works. As the piston is coming down during the power stroke, the top of the piston begins to uncover the exhaust port, which allows burnt gases to escape into the exhaust pipe. But there's a problem. The pressure within the combustion chamber drops off before all of the exhaust can be expelled. Unless it's removed, this leftover exhaust gas will remain in the combustion chamber with a fresh mixture, reducing the effectiveness of the next power stroke. That's where scavenging comes in. Before the exhaust port is fully open and the pressure within the combustion chamber completely drops off, the transfer ports also begin to open. This allows the pressure from the fresh air fuel mixture coming from below the piston to transfer into the combustion chamber which in turn raises the pressure in the combustion chamber and pushes the rest of the burnt gases into the exhaust pipe. Yamaha uses two different methods of scavenging. The cross scavenging design has an advantage in applications like small outboard motors because it has good scavenging characteristics at the low throttle openings common in trolling. It uses a piston with a special crown design to help direct the fresh charge of air fuel mixture within the combustion chamber. The best choice when high performance is demanded is loop charge scavenging. As we see here, the transfer ports are positioned on the sides of the cylinder and directed toward the intake side. This causes the fresh air fuel charges entering the combustion chamber to collide with one another at the intake side and then loop around toward the exhaust port, pushing the burnt gases into the exhaust pipe, hence the term loop charge scavenging. Because the piston is not used to deflect the fresh charge in the desired direction, as with cross scavenging, this loop charge design allows the use of a relatively flat piston crown. The advantages of this design are a smaller combustion chamber with higher compression ratios. Loop charging translates into greater power output from the same size power plant than one using a different design. There is also less potential for pre-ignition or detonation occurring due to hot spots on the top of the piston. 
Port layout is an important consideration in a loop charged engine. The location of the ports in the cylinder and their size and height relative to piston placement throughout the stroke will affect the power characteristics of the engine. Let's compare a Grand Prix road racing motorcycle with a small outboard motor. The motorcycle requires constant high RPM with large throttle openings and closings. Our small outboard, on the other hand, is usually used for slow speed, low RPM operation with minimal throttle opening. The port timing needs of these two engines would be entirely different. Port timing in a two-stroke is fixed, so port design is very critical for a given application. And what works well in one application may not work well in another. Fortunately, over the years, two-stroke engine technology has found a way to overcome this to some extent. This technology is best known as the power valve. The power valve moves its position up or down in the exhaust port. A mechanical linkage or servo motor controls the power valve's position to have the exhaust port open later for good low end power, then gradually open sooner as engine RPM increases for good mid range and top end. In effect, the power valve changes the fixed exhaust port timing into variable timing, making the engine capable of strong power output over a much broader RPM range. Exhaust system design is as critical as port timing and should be built to suit the application of the engine. As we saw earlier, some of the fresh air fuel mixture entering the combustion chamber is lost out of the exhaust port as it follows the escaping exhaust gases. An exhaust pipe that's properly designed for a given engine will send a perfectly timed negative sound wave back up to the exhaust port which actually pushes the lost fresh air fuel mixture back into the combustion chamber. Now that we've completed the theory section, let's look at the two-stroke engine lubrication methods. As we saw earlier, a two-stroke uses its lower crankcase as part of the intake process. It also uses roller bearings for the crankshaft and needle bearings for the connecting rods so it doesn't require a high pressure oiling system the way a four stroke with plane bearings does. For these reasons, a two stroke engine has the oil needed for its proper lubrication mixed with its fuel supply. There are two ways to achieve this. One is with the use of a low pressure oil pump or injector such as Yamaha's Autolube and Precision Blend systems. This type pumps oil from a remote oil reservoir into the carburetor the intake manifold or directly into the crankcase. The other method is referred to as premix. The oil is simply premixed at a prescribed ratio with gasoline before it's put into the fuel tank. Both systems work well, but both have advantages and disadvantages. One advantage of an auto lube type system over premix is convenience. There's no need to mix gas and oil separately. This best fits applications such as street motorcycles and scooters, snowmobiles, water vehicles, and large outboards where frequent refueling or a lot of fuel is required because it eliminates the need to mix the oil with the fuel every time. Another advantage is economy. An engine like a high performance outboard, for example, may need a rich 50 to 1 mixture at full throttle but just 200 to 1 at idle. The Precision Blend system delivers the right amount of oil needed for each operating condition to ensure economical lubrication. In applications such as motorcycle road racing, motocross, and water vehicle racing, convenience and economy are not major factors. The emphasis is on consistent jetting and weight savings with as few mechanical parts as possible. That's why premix is better suited for competition use. There are two different ways an auto lube type pump can meter the oil. The constant ratio type pump bases its output solely on engine RPM. Pump output increases as RPM increases in a constant ratio. The other type is the variable ratio pump. This pump bases its output on RPM and throttle position. Although both types work very well, the variable type pump is somewhat more efficient than the constant type. 
A variable pump increases output with RPM like the constant type, but it can also control how much that increase is based on the amount of throttle being applied. A greater amount of oil is required at larger throttle openings than smaller ones. The constant ratio pump, variable pump, and premix lubrication systems all have legitimate uses in different applications, so the technician should be comfortable working with all three types. Having an understanding exactly how a two-stroke works makes it much easier to understand how to diagnose a two-stroke problem. There are three systems to consider when diagnosing a problem in any engine, whether two-stroke or four-stroke. Mechanical, electrical, and fuel. A malfunction with any one of these systems will result in poor performance, or even worse, an engine that will not run at all. Let's take a look at some basic diagnostic techniques involving these three systems. For details on performing any of the following tests, refer to the Diagnostic Tools video course series. We'll start with a mechanical system. Compression test. Perform this preliminary test whenever a mechanical problem is suspected. Compression that's below the minimum specification or is even zero shows that a mechanical problem does exist. Vacuum pressure test. Perform this procedure after the compression test has indicated a definite mechanical problem, but always before engine disassembly. This test can help determine if the failure was related to an air leak within the seal crankcase. It can also be performed after repair has been completed to ensure that any pre-existing air leak has been eliminated. Now we'll move to the electrical system. Dynamic spark tester. This tester will assist you in determining if a misfire or running problem is related to the ignition system. CDI or Y1 tester. You can use this tool to determine which component of the ignition system has failed once an ignition problem has been confirmed. Raypair peak reading voltmeter. This meter is another piece of test equipment useful to determine which component of the ignition system has failed. Ignition coil tester. If the condition of the ignition coil is suspect, verify its condition with this tool. Last is the fuel system. Fuel level gauge. It's used to determine if incorrect fuel level is a cause of a fuel related running problem. Fuel pressure gauge. Used in applications where an external vacuum type or electric fuel pump is used, such as outboard motors. It will verify if the fuel system is supplying the carburetors or fuel injectors with correct and constant fuel pressure. Low fuel pressure can cause a lean running condition or piston seizure. Pop-off pressure gauge. Used on floatless type carburetors that are most commonly used on water vehicles. It measures the amount of pressure it takes to open the needle and seat which allows fuel to enter the carburetor. Too much pop-off pressure will cause a lean condition and too little will cause a rich condition at low throttle openings. And the alcohol tester. This should be used when fuel contamination, such as alcohol or water, are a suspected cause of a poor running condition. It is capable of detecting the amount, but not the type of alcohol in a given fuel sample. Carburetor tuning can also be considered part of fuel system diagnostics. Proper jetting is critical to a two-stroke's performance and reliability. Most production two-stroke engines are jetted for sea level operation and average temperatures. Obviously, the world has many locations far above sea level, so jetting changes are sometimes necessary. This is particularly true in engines used in high elevation areas of 5,000 feet or above. Many times there are factory recommendations for jetting specifications at given altitudes and temperatures. These specifications have been tested and should be followed closely. Occasionally some slight variation may be necessary for altitudes that are in between the recommendation chart. Take care when going to a leaner setting. 
Jetting a two-stroke two-lane can cause combustion chamber temperatures to rise above the critical level, resulting in detonation, pre-ignition, or a piston seizure. This is where reading a spark plug can be very helpful. Analyzing or reading the color of the porcelain casing around the spark plug center electrode tells a lot about what's happening in the engine. The color of the tip and center of the porcelain indicate how the engine is running at low and mid throttle, while the very bottom of the porcelain indicates how it's running at wide open throttle. To view the entire porcelain of the spark plug, you'll need a special magnifier with a light. The ideal spark plug color is a light chocolate brown on the entire porcelain area. A very dark brown or black color indicates a rich condition, and a white porcelain indicates an extremely lean condition. To get a proper plug reading, use a new spark plug and avoid prolonged idling or lugging of the engine. Another quick way to test for a lean or rich condition is to check engine response when extreme throttle openings are applied from an idle. If the engine has a heavy hesitation or stalls out, the jetting is probably very lean and should be adjusted accordingly. If the engine revs up slowly, smokes heavily and seems sluggish, jetting is probably too rich. Again, make the proper adjustments to correct the situation. When the jetting is properly adjusted, the engine RPM should respond with a throttle application and have a crisp exhaust note. Perform these diagnostic tests whenever a poor running condition exists. But what about finding the cause of a problem when mechanical failure has already taken place? It's important to diagnose the cause of a mechanical failure once it has occurred to be able to prevent the failure from occurring again after the repair. The most common mechanical failure in a two-stroke engine is piston failure, and there are many reasons why it can occur. The types of failures we'll cover here are piston breakage, detonation and pre-ignition problems, and piston seizures. As we saw earlier, it's very important to perform a pressure vacuum test before you tear down the engine. Once the engine is apart, it's impossible to check to see if the failure was due to an air leak in the seal crankcase area. Let's take a look at piston breakage failures first. If the lower skirt of the piston is broken off, yet the piston shows few or no seizure marks, the failure was more than likely caused by extreme piston to cylinder wall clearance. Piston breakage can also be caused by over revving the engine. This usually causes catastrophic damage in the engine, but the most common evidence for over revving is a piston pin that appears to have been torn out of the piston. Now we'll look at some failures caused by detonation and pre-ignition. Detonation is caused by increased pressure and extreme heat in the combustion chamber, which results in the fuel mixture burning too quickly. Instead of burning evenly to create a smooth power stroke, the mixture explodes. The explosions caused by detonation hammer away at the piston, usually eating away the exhaust side of the piston crown. Extreme cases can have severe erosion to the exhaust side of the piston around the ring lands and may also show signs of piston seizure. Pre-ignition results when the fuel-air mixture ignites before the normal ignition spark occurs. The mixture is already starting to burn when the spark plug ignites the fuel. The two flame fronts collide, causing extreme pressure, heat, and vibration. Failure caused by pre-ignition usually results in a hole being blown through the top of the piston crown. This failure results in no compression within the cylinder. Some of the causes of detonation or pre-ignition are lean jetting, air leak, ignition timing far too advanced, fuel octane rating too low, fuel contaminated by water or alcohol, or hot spots in the combustion chamber. Hot spots can be caused by a piece of the head gasket protruding into the combustion chamber, a glowing hot piece of carbon on the piston crown, or any other small sharp edge that may get extremely hot during combustion. Another type of piston failure is due to seizure. Seizure results when piston temperature becomes so extreme that the piston actually melts and sticks to the cylinder wall. Piston seizure most commonly occurs when the air fuel mixture is too lean 
or there's a lack of lubrication. Here is a piston that sees from a lean air fuel mixture. Typically, the piston will have seizure marks on the exhaust side of the skirt and around the wrist pin area. When looking for the cause of the lean condition, check for incorrect jetting or an air leak in the seal crankcase area. Here is a piston which sees from a lack of lubrication. All related seizure results in heavy scoring all the way around the piston. Without adequate lubrication barrier, the piston rubs directly against the cylinder wall until so much heat builds up that piston material wells itself to the cylinder. Whatever type of failure is found, it's extremely critical to find and correct the cause. Just replacing damaged parts can often mean a repeat failure. The last section of this video deals with proper maintenance of a two-stroke engine. As with any type of engine, maintenance is a vital part of prolonging the life of a two-stroke. One of the most important items is the air filter. Most street vehicles use a replaceable paper type filter, while off-road vehicles use a cleanable foam type filter. In either case, monitoring the filter's condition is very important, especially after riding in extremely dusty, dirty, or wet conditions. If the air filter is allowed to get over-contaminated with dirt, it will cause the engine to run very rich, or even worse, allow dirt to pass through the filter. Dirt acts like sandpaper in an engine, causing extreme wear. Excessive piston to cylinder wall clearance is one common result, which as we saw earlier, can cause piston skirt breakage if left unrepaired. It's important to follow the recommended air filter service procedure. A paper filter is simply removed and replaced with a new one. But a foam filter is carefully cleaned with solvent or hot soapy water, dried, and then oil with foam filter oil. The oil helps the dirt adhere to the filter instead of passing through it. Be sure the filter is properly reinstalled to prevent any gaps where dirt can pass through. Because two strokes burn oil with a fuel, they tend to build up carbon deposits much more quickly than four strokes. Too much carbon buildup will increase the compression within the combustion chamber. This can eventually lead to pre-ignition from a glowing hot piece of carbon or detonation from the compression being too high for the recommended fuel being used. For this reason, it is necessary to periodically remove the cylinder head to decarbonize it and the piston crown. A way to prevent carbon buildup is to use a combustion deposit cleaning fuel additive such as Yamaha's Ring Free. The periodic use of Ring Free will help prevent carbon buildup in the combustion chamber as well as prevent varnish buildup around the piston rings. Occasionally, it will also be necessary to replace the piston and rings. The interval varies considerably depending on the application and how well regular maintenance is performed. Over time, normal wear will increase the piston to cylinder wall clearance. Increased mechanical noise is the major indicator that there's excessive clearance. This noise, typically referred to as piston slap, is caused by the piston skirt banging into the cylinder wall when it changes the direction of travel within the cylinder bore. If this condition is not fixed, piston breakage can occur. Preparation for prolonged storage is also an important part of preventive maintenance. Many applications such as snowmobiles, outboards, and water vehicles are only used during certain times of the year and may go many months without operation. In these cases, it is necessary to take certain precautions to ensure that the engine will be in good working order when it comes time to use it again. The first step is to completely fill the fuel tank and the oil injector tank if applicable. This will prevent condensation from building up inside the tanks. Then to stabilize the fuel, add the prescribed amount of fuel stabilizer to the fuel supply. This will help to keep the fuel fresh during storage. Run the engine long enough to allow the newly conditioned fuel to run through the entire system. Fogging the engine is the next step. Fogging oil is specially formulated to coat the internal parts of the engine and stick to them over prolonged periods of non-use. 
This helps any corrosion that may otherwise take place. While running the engine, spray the fogging oil into the intake until the extra oil almost causes the engine to stall. It's a good idea to replace the spark plugs after the engine is put back into service as they may become foul from the fogging oil. Using silicon spray on everything helps to reduce the corrosion of metal and the deterioration of rubber components. And last, remove the battery, charge it fully, then store it in a dry, safe place away from any open flame. It's also a good idea to charge the battery periodically while it's out of service. Refer to the owner's and or service manuals of the specific model you're working on for the necessary specifications and intervals of all maintenance items mentioned here. This concludes our video program. Effective service and repair of two-stroke engines depend on a clear understanding of their operation as well as familiarity with necessary diagnostic techniques. We hope the material presented here has helped to increase your knowledge and the level of service you deliver to your customers.